Episode 86 of Invisible Walls is about to start. It's Friday, and this is not Shane. Um, we play musical <laughs> chairs surreal, in the man. office. Yeah, it's really <laughs> strange. This is Marcus Beer. Uh, I am your guest host for today, for reasons that will become apparent later. But uh, welcome to the show. We've got a tight crew and a kick-ass schedule for you today. Uh, going round the horn, I'm channeling Shane here. <laughs> <laughs> around the horn. Going around the horn to my left. We have the editor-in-chief of Game Trailers, and the person will be hosting it again next week, Shane Satterfield. I am up in this piece. <laughs> next to Shane, we have Patrick the God Morales. Howdy, mortals. Did he just call you? <laughs> <laughs> Mike Dangerous Damiani. Very dangerous. <laughs> wow. And Ryan yeah. R-Type Stevens. Uh, tight posse. And uh, we do have uh, John Chang working our soundboard as usual. He's not mic'd up and he's not going to talk today, but we want to give him some love. Props. So, on with the show. Think about what you're doing. Any of this look familiar? Wait, that's... Yeah, that's where the Nobby used to live. Before you stepped in. All right, first up, we are going to talk about a game that's based on supposedly the big blockbuster movie of the Hollywood season, James Cameron's return after Titanic and you know going underwater and doing <laughs> Avatar. Um, this is the game that Cameron obviously talked about for 30 or 40 weeks at E3 from the Ubisoft press conference, didn't show any footage, continually talked and talked and talked. We didn't see anything, and now we have the game in. They, they didn't send it to us for preview either. Yeah, there haven't been many previews, but, um, you know, you guys have played it. Is it really as bad as I think it's going to be? It's, not, it's not horrible, but, I mean, the, your, your level of, of enjoyment is going to be fleeting throughout it. Um, basically, think of a very old, like, I used to hate third-person shooters, you know? The, um, up until RE4, Gears with this cover system, I always felt like third-person shooting, like, the early SOCOM games, if you came from playing like first person shooters on the PC, they're kind of mm -hmm. shit. Yeah, those um, games were crazy popular. Those SOCOM games for PS2. Yeah, because they were online. Yeah. You know, I mean, you throw that on back then when it's the only game in town. But on like the third, PS2. third person shooting, um, I, I think, is really coming to its own, but it's kind of got, um, I mean, I would say it's definitely below like Lost Planet. I, I hear that getting thrown around a lot. Um, yeah, definitely when I went into playing it, the first few minutes I played it, I was like, oh wow, this looks like a Lost Planet, you know, ripoff. And slowly, about 30 minutes when you get into the game, you find out it is no longer like Lost Planet. Right, so well, what's but the, the, other, the other side of it is uh, they've obviously some lead creative designer plays a lot of World of Warcraft <laughs> and has mapped MMO style quests on top of it, but not particularly well. It's all very masturbatory. You can only do one set quest at a time. So there's like this illusion that you can do all this other stuff, but you can only do the one quest, and you'll only really ever level up from completing a quest, and since the quest progression is linear, it, it's, it seems ridiculous when you level up. It's like you're at this point meant to get this stuff, and it's just handed to you. There's no like economy or anything. So it's just like if you're playing an old school game and you, know, you get to a new level and they give you a new weapon. So it seems like kind of a, a conceit. There's a tiny, tiny bit of side quest, but it's always like explore the map or you know collect 10 seeds, but then the actual main quests are like kill 25 viper wolves or you know, activate three crystals, and then but you have to then rinse, wash, repeat, activate three crystals again on this other map, so et cetera, et cetera. All, cetera. all the generic FedEx quests you get in any MMO. Yeah, I mean, there's there's the occasional cool battle, you know, like giant, like if you're playing as the, you can play as two different sides, and they play a little bit differently, but they're still kind of similar, and there's a lot of shooting. Um, but aren't the quests completely different? No, there's even some crossover there, like, you know, like How you make... that be? Well, one you still have to, a human, the other what, is nasty, but you, right? you still have to like collect the same stuff sometimes. <laughs> no. So I mean, or get from point. A lot of it's just point A to point B too, and that's what a lot of games are. But when they kind of map it out that way, and there's the XP bundle at the end, it feels it kind of cheapens it when the overall experience of getting XP doesn't really feel like a payoff at all. I feel it around with a mech at E3. How much is that a part of the game? There's vehicles and stuff when you're playing as the humans, and there's some there's some creatures you can ride. Um, it's a it's a small part of it. Um, I didn't really think it was anything particularly special. 
Uh, in the multiplayer, the mech suits, a little fun to just jump in just for the health bonus. Uh, you can get dropped in this game. Uh, like you said, you, you were playing it at E3. You can get dropped in this game pretty easily. Like oh, yeah, you can I died be, over and over. You can be like, oh, I'm going to go try to like uh, shoot this guy or pound this guy, and you get there. Someone gets in, like the AI gets a beat on you, and you could be dead in like four seconds, even while you're trying to like. And then, then they have these activated abilities. I don't think short cooldowns, I think, work for action games. But like you know, like anyone who's played an MMO and you have your abil your Uber ability, you can use every ten minutes or hour or whatever like that. Kind of works, and MMOs have a little bit of the action side. But here, I mean, this is a literal Twitch game. You're running around shooting people, you know, trying to get close for that, like you know, the quick melee kill. And then you have this thing that has like a four minute cooldown, you're going to probably pass it up just so you can keep using, like, your shields and your health, which recharge, like, in a, res you know, a reasonable time, like, you know, like, 10 seconds or something like that, or something that's constantly becomes part of the strategy instead of this kind of one-off thing. It would almost make more sense if they had them as, like, inventory items, because at least you're used to that sort of mapping, like, oh, I have, like, you know, I only have so much ammo for my, you know, my BFG, so I'm going to just use it here and then, instead of these kind of weird cooldowns. It doesn't really fit. Yeah, that was my biggest gripe with it, were the cooldowns in it. Not necessarily, like, the WoW style quests. I didn't play it long enough for that to, like, really rear its head. But just from the very get-go, the cooldowns, like, you can't even run in the game. There's a default speed you move at. And one of the one of the abilities you use is to do the short dash. It's either the Navi or the RDA. And you dash about 10 seconds, and you got to wait, like, a minute to use it again. I was like, what's the purpose of this? And then you can, re you can do, like, a health boost for a second. And... It was not, not just the cooldowns, but there wasn't that much diversity between the RDA and the Navi's yeah, I mean, cooldowns. I think it felt like I was playing the, aside from the physical character model, I felt like I was playing the same yeah, the, type of thing. The Navi get melee, but they still have guns. Yeah, and, the bow. Right and the, gun, yeah. the, the RDA has kind of some more like explicitory weapons, but they, they play fairly similar. How does so? How does the, the the story of the game fit into the movie? I mean, have you? Are it they basically takes place wrestling? two years before, but um, there's a lot of plot, but it's kind of just dished out haphazardly. Like you start like this little Sigourney Weaver screen is like, I hope you have a good time, and I'm like, good time doing what? Okay, I'm here. <laughs> and there, there's a lot of exposition, but it, it's kind of a little all over the place, and it's, big things are always happening. But when it's all just kind of being shoved in there, it's kind of hard to really care. And it's a little heavy-handed, like, you know, it's like, they're destroying our planet, or it's like, we have to destroy the planet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's kind of awesome. So this is but, really the greatest <laughs> ad for the movie, because, I mean, there's, there's, there's well, so much... Well, the atmosphere works. I mean, the actual, the, the actual, like, plot is maybe a little disheveled, but, I th like, yeah, it's got the kind of the whole Metroid, you know, you can scan stuff and learn about stuff. And the actual architecture is pretty cool for the most part. There's some kind of forest hallways, but once you get to the places where you're actually, like, climbing and stuff. But that was another big gripe. You get falling damage for, like, really small tumbles. Like, I kind of, like, jump off a ledge, and, like, I'm this giant acrobatic blue thing, and it's like, <laughs> It's like, okay. Are you more excited for the movie or less excited for the movie having played this? Because this is arguably the biggest movie of the year, maybe for a couple years. Well, uh, let's precursor that with, were you even excited for the movie in the first place? Uh, I know a lot of people <laughs> who just don't seem yeah. to know. I mean, I'm kind of the audience... For this movie, I'm like a, you know, big nerd virgin. Um, so, uh, I have hated... Uh, the plot seems okay, and I'm probably going to see it, maybe not day one. And also, I think I brought this up, and there were some weird comments about this. Yes, I am blind in one eye, so I can't see any of the 3D stuff, so I'm not going to march down to the IMAX to try to see this, and it's glorious splendor. I would say it's not the best... Ad for the movie, no. but I don't really think games ever Were. are. <laughs> so, but I, I will have to say, since Ubi did um, Beowulf, which kind of has a similar sort of CG with real actor thing, that game was dog. Yes, this, right. this is not. This is dog. Vomit? It's kind of a. It's, kind, it's a mediocre game. Like you know, you you still have fun. You're you're still going through it, but some of it just seems kind of like masturbatory. All right, so moving on from Avatar, let's talk about a game that... A to Z. A to Z, we are. We're running <laughs> the gamut. Zinc. Z, Zed. indeed. Going back to my old school British days. But yeah, we're running the gamut. Now we're going to talk about um, a game that's really good, and it comes from Nintendo. Surprising. Yes. And it is from Nintendo first party, so it's not surprising. So, Mike, tell us all about the new Zelda game. Yeah, finally, the new Zelda game that seemed Nintendo decided to think didn't exist for a while there. They don't and, uh, promote their games much anymore, yeah, do they? They, 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 <laughs> they like to announce their Zelda games at GDC, apparently, now. Seems like they've <laughs> announced the last two ones, apparently. And then after they announced it, just kind of let it fall out of, you know, under the radar. 
and then they just blitzed it with media like a few weeks ago, just in time for like you know people to actually buy it for the holiday. But I mean that's that's that is Nintendo's always been Nintendo's thing. Oh. They, you know, they, they, with the ads and everything, they push the ads from about three weeks out, and but you see them everywhere. Not just the ads, but the media and stuff. The, this was a little different because with Phantom Hourglass and Twilight Princess, I mean, they started the media with those like really soon and like they were really long-winded like, you know, hype trains for those where this, they kind of like started really close to the release date. And they said that they prefer it that way actually, so I guess we're going to be seeing that going forward. But uh, as for the actual game, um, if you played Phantom Hourglass, yes, it is very similar to Spirit Tracks. It still uses the stylus input. No, there is no D-pad controls, which um, I'm still scratching my head at that one because uh, they, they, I still think there could be a nice hybrid with the two. But, you know, hey, it's Nintendo. They want their way. They'll get it. And uh, the one difference is is that the, you, don't, you don't go around in a boat anymore. You can't just draw your little path and go anywhere in the ocean. You have to stay on these rails. You use a train now. And you have to stay on these fixed paths. This is quite literally on rails. Is yeah, it, it is better? On. Why would they take away the freedom? It, it, it's a trade-off, I think. You, you do unlock more tracks as you progress through the game. You unlock new areas. So it's kind of an, an exp they're trying to do a different type of exploration where it's not just free roaming. We can go anywhere and maybe you'll find something. Because you remember Phantom Hourglass, it was a pretty large ocean. And there was very little populated in it aside from random enemies. For this game, it seems like they put a little more thought into crafting it. Where you unlock a new path, it's, there's going to be something hidden along that way. You want to try and unlock these new paths so that you, could, uh, you get more out of the game from it. But the trade-off is, you, don't, you see this nice little forest over here, you can't go there. You're, you're stuck on this like, set path and you can't deviate from it. So it, it, there is... It's very anti-Zelda. It is yeah. different. It is not that part of it is very not traditional Zelda, but I would say everything else in the game is still pretty much what you would expect from a Zelda game. So for some people, the train part m might be a turn off. I mean, if you didn't like the boat segment, I, I can see the the train segment to me feels better and more refined in the boat. But if you're the one who's like, I need an overworld to explore, I need to like go anywhere. That part of it might not be your cup of tea, but the rest of the game is still really good Zelda. So that that that's a coin toss for the train segment, but there's still a lot of game left for it. Is there so, no overworld at all? The each air, the, the, you go around in the train on the big map. When you get to each location, there's like an overall. It's like Phantom Marcos. Remember the islands? Yeah. It's just that again. Gotcha. So that that's how it's structured. You couldn't get out of the boat and just walk around anywhere. So let's talk so. a little bit about multiplayer. Cause I remember last week uh, watching all four of you yeah. <laughs> sitting around with your DSs and you. Were giggling like a bunch of schoolgirls. Yeah, it's mindless fun. That, that, that's all it's designed to be, and it achieves its goal in that. It, it's not super in depth. I think you'll get maybe a few hours of fun from it if you decide to play it. But how does it how does it work? No, yeah. it works. No, there has been a lot of the misinformation out there. It actually is not online. It is only local Wi-Fi. So if I have one game and one DS and you have your DSs, we can play four of us with just one cart through download play. Or if everyone has their game, you can play it as well. But there is no online mode to it, which is strange because uh, Phantom Hourglass had online as well as uh, the local Wi-Fi. Is there any so, difference between everyone having a cart and everyone not having a cart? Um, Content-wise, no, but I did notice there's, it takes a little bit longer to load everything for the download play, and there was a slight little bit of lag every now and then when you did the download play, but it was very minuscule. But in terms of actually like content unlocked, no, there is no difference between that. Um, it's basically six arenas. Uh, it's like you play for three or four minutes, depends on how many players. It's like kind of Mario Kart style where you're like you can get items, use them against each other, and you're trying to collect these gems, and whoever is the most at the end wins. And they throw all these m obstacles at you, so it's just really insane and it's and mindless. Yeah, sounds it, like they put uh, a lot of thought into it. <laughs> it's it's entertaining, but it's a little disappointing to you that there's only one type of versus match. Yeah, the, there there is only one mode. It is collect all the gems in the time limit. There isn't. Any other? There's no like battle mode. There's yeah. no like, no, like race. There's no race. Kind of where Four Swords Adventures had the multiplayer modes, where they're, like racing a battle mode, this type of mode. So it is. It is very kind of bare bones. If is you there any that. incentive to go back? Is there a leaderboard or an achievement? Or you get a. I mean, because it's not online, the, the, the that the there is a ranking system. Like it's exactly like Phantom Hourglass. You're in battle points if you win. You get a better ranking. So when you play with other people, it shows your rank and your win loss ratio. But because it's not online, it's kind of meaningless. You're just playing with your friends, and they kind of like you know lessen the impact of that. So I, I, I online it, the multiplayer is there if you want it. I, I personally, it I don't need a multiplayer in Zelda. I it's a single player game, and the multiplayer is kind of this like extra part that 
I, it doesn't really interest me that much and it doesn't need to be there but for those people who want it it's there but take it for what it is it's just you know this party game type thing so uh, what, what, go on right uh, I was going to say like I, I really liked Phantom Hourglass my, my big problem with it was I thought the overall experience was good but it was a little depressing almost that the dungeons were fun but even your first time through they were they could super easy yeah. you could do them in under an hour and yeah. for even though it's a portable Zelda you know a yeah. portable uh, Zelda dungeon is supposed to be something that you wrap your brain and thumbs around for at least a couple of hours I'd like to like I'd like to think how are the dungeons this time around oh yeah I mean uh, we, we talked about this earlier. I, the, the beginning of the game, it, d it doesn't it doesn't exactly uh, uh, impress you with the length of dungeons. It's kind of a, a really long tutorial for about the first hour of the game. The train segment, the dungeon segments. Once you get over that first hump and get into the real dungeons, like the second dungeon, the third dungeon, and so on. Uh, when I was playing through it the second time here, uh, again, it was still taking me over 25 minutes knowing what to do to beat the second dungeon in the game. The later dungeons are even longer. So yes, the dungeons are pretty lengthy. Um, they're going to take around a half an hour to an hour on average for you know a player to beat. And uh, even though there seems to be only a low count of traditional dungeons, don't be deceived by that. There's a there's a central dungeon that uh, you go back to and you go to new parts of it, and they're like a new dungeon every time you go back to it as well. So would you say the Spirit Tracks is uh, a good filler for anybody who's craving their Zelda fix between now and whenever we get the next big Zelda on the Wii? Is it is it a good filler? Oh, definitely. And if and if you didn't like Phantom Hourglass or it wasn't enough Zelda for you, this one will it'll rectify everything that wasn't good about Phantom Hourglass. All right, so now we're going to talk about a game that has been a uh, most requested favorite on the uh, Invisible Walls comment section for the last like six weeks. We're going to talk about Battlefield um, Bad Company 2. Now, a lot of people have been bitching that we haven't covered this game. Well, we haven't had a chance to play it up until now. Patrick, you've been playing the, the multiplayer beta like yes. a, a madman. And Correct. it actually looks really it looks really cool. It, uh, it looks like the total um, antidote to all those who are really bored with Twitch gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have to say, after playing a lot of Modern Warfare 2, like everyone else, uh, which is predominantly a very deathmatchy kind of game, uh, it, it's good to step into a tank once again, and just vehicles, and you know, sprawl through this uh, gigantic map, taking down targets. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited for it. I was a big fan of the classic Battlefield games, and uh, I think the multiplayer beta looks promising so far. Yeah, it, it looks like they've you know they've basically looked at um, every other solid military game out there and said, mm -hmm. all right, we're going back to our roots. We, you know, the, when I s sat there and watched you and you you climbed up on the big tower and you were, you were sniping guys and I saw the tanks coming at you in the jeeps, it really took me back again to you know one of my favorite demos of all time, 1942 Wake Island, where you'd have the jeeps and you'd have everything coming at you and it was just really cool. But you could play so many different ways; it gives you so much variety. Right. And the maps are friggin' huge. Oh yeah, that's definitely you know the trademark of Battlefield games. And uh, it, it feels really good to just, it, it, if you're a sniper or a assault class or an engineer, uh, it feels good to kind of explore the maps at your own pace and kind of formulate your own strategies rather than having to memorize this kind of like small area and then just figure out the best camping spots. A lot of it is very much, you know, rooted in teamwork this time around, uh, getting in vehicles together, you know, or, you know, become an engineer, repair them. There, there are a lot of different ways you could contribute to the fight rather than just having a cool, you know, kill-death ratio. How many kits are there? Um... So there are three class archetypes, or four. There's Assault, Engineer, Sniper, and uh, what was the other one? Medic. Medic, yes, that's right. <coughs> and within those, you, as you play each class, uh, you're given more things to spec your loadout with. So you can get different rifles, you can get different grenades, uh, things like that. So it's, it's coming a little bit closer to how Modern Warfare is doing it. Is it but within each remember, game? Remember, Battlefield or? 2 was actually before Modern Warfare. That's it, true. It had the weapons unlocks and all that stuff first. That's true, but I think with their kind of take on perks and upgrades, it's kind of like converging a little bit. So it, it's like a little mix of both. Other than weapons and stuff, are there things that are kind of like auxiliary, like perks cuz they're definitely going after modern warfare. I mean they said so they said so at Gamescom. They're like this is going to be a better multiplayer experience than Modern Warfare 2 we're saying it right now. Yeah, again, so I'm curious if they are bringing in the sort of weapons is one thing but the kind yep. of perks side of things is that being represented? Uh, yep, you're seeing a little bit of perks uh, or their take on it uh, and again that's where we're kind of seeing a little bit of overlap there. Can you summon blue phantoms? Uh, no, but I okay. wish you could. <laughs> What's, what upgrades are there to this game that you didn't see in Battlefield 2? Because I literally played Battlefield 2 for 
almost two years. I mm -hmm. got hopelessly addicted to that game. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what are the changes here? Or is this finally Battlefield 2 coming to the console? I think one of the coolest things uh, that I've experienced in the beta <clears throat> was the whole destructible element of it. Because uh, you know, one of the biggest problems that some people may have is you know, if you have a sniper you know, at a roost and it's like hard to take them out. But if you get into a tank, you can blow them the f out of there. Right. <laughs> so, I like that. Yeah. So yeah, almost all, almost all, if not all, of the environments within the maps are destructible. So if you chip at them away enough, they will crumble. They will destroy. The environment will change. Which was in the first Bad Company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, so, it, but it makes it it makes it more useful to be an engineer class then because you yeah. can actually you know you can go and counter it for once as opposed to you know just feel you know you you know your building's crumbling around you. Cause the engineer class has always felt a little redundant in a lot of games. Nobody's really mm -hmm. implemented it as perhaps as well as they, they should, apart from perhaps Team Fortress 2. So. Right. Can, you, can you do well if you ignore vehicles? Because sometimes in a first-person shooter, I just want to be a first-person shooter. I don't want to jump into the mm -hmm. whirly bird or whatever. And how much are you running? Because in Battlefield 2, uh, I mean, you <laughs> spawn, there'd be no vehicles, and you'd literally have to run two miles, you get shot in the head, and then you spawn again, and then you run more. Yeah. To answer Ryan's question, um, yes, you can do pretty well without a vehicle uh, if you are very proactive about destroying theirs. Okay. So you know, if you are, you got some heavy weapons. Yeah. You can if you're an engineer, you know, you might want to take out some of their vehicles if you're not in one yourself. And uh, to answer your question, uh, in terms of running around, of course, with the size of the map, there will be some running. But I think they've got, done a good job with uh, handling respawns that uh, you won't have to see too much of it. Respawns in the sense that once you take control of a point on the map. Uh, your whole squad will start from that point, so you won't have to, you know, start from the very beginning. And in the sense that uh, they will respawn vehicles in at a pretty frequent rate, so that even if someone swoops one right in front of you, you won't have to wait too long to hop into a jeep. So you've played a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. What's your overall verdict? Uh, so far, I I'm pretty pleased with it. You know, it's definitely a different feel than modern warfare for sure. But then again, it's it's a good thing because you know some people might get tired of doing simple deathmatch games. I think uh, if you like team-based shooters, you'll definitely take to it, and uh, can't wait to see more. All right. So interestingly enough, new Medal of Honor. Yep. Announced. Mm -hmm. Breaking news: It's going to be teasered at the VGAs. I think. Well, the teaser is already up. Is it? If it wasn't that like secret game number two or whatever we just put up yesterday? Maybe. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> no, I mean, half these games are, like look like modern warfare. Takes so well, yeah. The 2K game looked just like Modern Warfare, yeah. set in Dubai. I, I think I think zombies and robot ninjas are going to take a backseat to just daily modern grit, killing terrorists for a while. So, what have you heard about Medal of Honor? Because you you had some interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, very little details of it so far, but yes, there will be a new Medal of Honor game. Uh, what has been confirmed so far is that it will take place in Afghanistan, uh, which is interesting uh, because they're they're supposedly offering this very realistic take of you know the war that's going on right now. Uh, in the Middle East. Do so we get 30,000 more troops? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know about Bin Laden, but um, it's interesting to see how it all pan out, you know, especially considering, uh, you know, with Konami and uh, Six Days in Fallujah. You know, well, I know they've been working on Medal of Honor games all this time, and mm. I have, have some friends who have worked on those games, and they'd work on them for a while, then they get canned, and the last I heard was the team was disbanded, so... The franchise has been in the doldrums a bit. I mean, it certainly lost ground. It, you know, it came out the same. Uh, it was doing really well, and then it did lose ground. To well, I think Rising people. Sun was that the. I think that was the death knell for that franchise. That was the one that was set in the Pacific Rim, I believe. Or get Rim being Oof. operative word. <laughs> I believe so, but it was awful. That was like the first really bad Medal of Honor game, and since then it's just kind of struggled along. Yeah. You know, what would be cool is if all the publishers could actually like kind of make some sort of like weak alliance, and they could have the same terrorists in all their games, <laughs> like some just like big you know fictional jerk that was just terrorizing like across like all these different franchises. <laughs> That's a pretty clever idea. Well, I'm sure we'll hear more about this moving forward. But I applaud the move moving from uh, World War Two because I'm sick of World War Two. Yeah, but aren't we also starting to get sick of Call no. of Duty Modern Warfare clothes. <laughs> 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 I mean, I don't blame you. I mean, if I, if I were the publisher and I was trying to look at a way to make profit, I think I would. Who, you'd be stupid probably not to try to replicate what Modern Warfare has done, right? I mean, half a billion dollars in a couple days in yeah. two territories. Right. And Johnny here just wants another Vegas, right? Another He's Rainbow Six? Silent Nod. <laughs>
All right, it's that time of year where the video game industry gets together and drinks and slaps itself on the back, and we have a, a you know a collective hug and say we're fantastic. It's the Spike VGAs, and they're coming up really soon, isn't that right, Shane? Yes, next weekend, folks. The Spike VGAs on Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. I think it's like seven o'clock Central. And we've already seen a couple what about of Mountain. Mountain time doesn't count. <laughs> what about Hawaiian time? <laughs> They are delaying it a little bit for the West Coast, I guess, is the most important point. It's actually being seen live all around the world this year. I think there's 180 countries or something. Is that on television or on the interwebs? On television in 180 countries. Pretty pretty freaking amazing. So check your local listings. Yeah, you're definitely. But uh, so, yeah, the VGAs are live this year. So if any... Anything bad happens, you guys will be sure to catch it. There's going to be no cuts, no edits, anything like that. We should make it fun. Lots um, of nudity. Ryan in a tutu. <laughs> you can promise that, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of nipple slips. Yeah. And ob obviously this year you guys can vote. You guys should go vote right now if you haven't. Um, every year after the VGAs, all we see on the site for a week afterwards is those people are insane. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. All right, this I won't year, post that this year, I promise. <laughs> This year you have no excuse. If your favorite game doesn't win and you didn't vote, you only have yourself to blame. So hop on over there and vote for all the categories. I think there's 30 categories. Yeah. There's a lot. I think the voting interface is pretty slick too. So it's actually very slick. It's, it's actually a very nice site. It's very you know, very nicely put together. Um, for some reason the words um, Call of Duty keep on cropping up yeah. several times. <laughs> so I am working on a, on a plan that every time somebody votes for Call of Duty, uh, the vote goes to Batman Arkham Asylum instead. <laughs> so um, th there you go. But we've both done the um, the preview shows for Game Trailers TV. Yeah, we'll both be on the preview show, which uh, you'll... First, well, first show actually aired last night, right. and that's probably on the site right now. Yep. And then the next show airs next Thursday night. Yep. They spread... So wait, the, the show airs... There's two shows. We've been spread right. across two shows. Yeah. There you go. That's not something we get to say very often. <laughs> <laughs> or ever. Yeah, they were really desperate. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the other thing that you want to watch the shows for are the exclusives. Obviously, you've yeah. probably seen a couple of the teasers already that we put up. There's going to be 10 exclusives in the show, and they're not new video footage of games that you already know about. These are all brand new, unannounced games. Debuts. So they're debuts. It's, a, it's huge as it gets. 10 in one show. Uh, I don't see any reason why anyone who loves video games wouldn't want to check that out. Um, really excited about it around here. We think everyone's going to be really happy with the show. We listened to your feedback last year. We made some tweaks based upon it. Uh, at the very least, everyone watch it so you can give us more feedback so we can keep making the show better. But yeah, next Saturday, December 12th, 8 o'clock. Check it out. Should definitely, definitely be worth watching. All right, we've got a giveaway. Ah, oh, we should have a drum roll. Giveaway! No, it's a giveaway. It's beta time, people. Um, and we're giving away, for some lucky PS3 owners, access to the uh, beta for Bayonetta, or Bayonetta, or Baywatchonetta, or Sarah Palin in the game, whatever. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're giving away a whole bunch of codes for the um, PS3, the PS3 version. Yes, Only. triple, indeed. PS triple. Now, I think this is US only again, isn't it? It is. It yes. is US only. So apologies. Sorry. apologies. Uh, so basically, you need to go to www.gametrailers.com/users/beta-king. B-E-T-A-K-I-N-G, and then you need to message the beta king because it's an actual account, and you put the in the subject line, type in bayonetta. And we will be uh, messaging back the codes to your GT account. So you have to have the account uh, at the end of today, Friday, and then more on Monday. So it'll basically give uh, everybody a chance to get going and start and play some long head fun before the game ships at the beginning of next year. That's right. Little advance. <laughs> All right, so um, at the beginning of the show, I did say that there was a reason why uh, I'm hosting today, and Shane's very kindly you know, asked me to host. Um, this is actually my last show, uh, my last Invisible Walls. I know, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm choking up here. I'm going back, I've had a, I've had a really good offer to uh, head up the PR department for a company that I consider to be uh, an up and coming games uh, publisher and developer. They've got a really good business model. They've, got some, they've had some really good products this year. 
and um, just to be a part of that moving forward makes a lot of sense for me where I am right now in my life. It's hard as hell to stop doing this show in particular because I have an absolute blast. I made some really great friends. I mean, I get to hang out with you guys every week and everybody else who's here at Game Trailers across the board. And then there's the, you know, the fans, the people who listen, the people who give me shit on a regular basis. I'm going to miss those guys and all the people who say the nice stuff because at the end of the day, everybody's got their own opinions and that's what this is all about. So I want to take this opportunity to, first of all, thank Shane for bringing me on board 19 months ago. Wow. Um, That's hard to believe. Yeah, it's like two um, babies. <laughs> yeah, I think I came on. I think I came on board on like episode four. I think it was episode three or episode four, and then I was on twice a month for six months, and then I came on full time last year, last September. Um, Someone right now is updating the Wikipedia. <laughs> <entry. Yeah. laughs> but no, seriously, I mean, uh, you know, I haven't missed a show since last November. I'm the only person who's done that, so it's it's a big wrench. But I've loved it. It's been cool. Everybody who's like friended the Annoyed Gamer account and follow me on Twitter and, you know, thank you guys. I mean, it's been awesome. Just, you know, the thing I'll say is just keep on, you know, keep on just playing games. Just keep on enjoying yourselves and listen to shows like this and, you know, the Giant Bomb podcast and Bonus Round because everybody who talks about them, we care about games and that's what we've all got in common at the end of the day, no matter if you're a Sony fanboy or an Xbox or a Wii fanboy or whatever you want to call yourself. As long as you love good games, it doesn't really matter. So, um... Thanks again. Um, you can still friend my annoyed gamer account if you want. Uh, I'm still. I'll be checking in on it now. Uh, now uh, you know now and again. But yeah, I'm off uh, to go back to the world of PR, and you know you'll see my name on press releases, and I'll be coming back here to pimp games. Um, it's gonna be very awkward when you bring your first game here, Marcus. And you turn around and say, "What a bag of <laughs> shit!" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then you watch Invisible Walls, and we rail it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it's going to be interesting, and I, you know, I hope that we could perhaps find a way for me to come back for the hundredth show and say hi to everybody because I think it'd be cool. But yeah, thanks to everybody. Thanks for, to Shane for letting me host today. Um, I think on behalf of everybody, um, and for the last time for me. Whoa, 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 whoa! We got some stuff we want to say about you, Marcus. Oh, you here can't. We go. <laughs> <laughs> We're not just going to let it end like that. Oh, damn. I don't want to get too sappy here, Marcus, but you have been an integral part of the show. The show was kind of struggling to find its footing when we first started. Um, we kind of brought you in as an, on an experimental basis. Uh, you brought a lot of fervor to the show on a weekly basis. I think our debates and our arguments or whatever were some of the most shining moments of the show. Um, you know, and, and through all those arguments or whatever, we were always friends. I don't know Absolutely, if people realize yeah. that. Like, that was always just, that's just a show. And Marcus, I think, will always be our friend, which is probably more important than anything we've done here as far as work is concerned. You'll be our friend for life. We wish you the best of luck. I, we know you're going to do a great job because you are a great PR guy. And uh, just really proud of you for uh, getting the job that you got. Best of luck. Congratulations. And we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. And, yeah, I, I still think our ESRB episode where we <laughs> ragged on them for that three was our, our best one. And I still maintain that Valve would not make as much money on Left 4 Dead than the PS3. Well, it won't be the last <laughs> time you're on the show. <laughs> you can come back and try to ar fight that argument once again. All right. So uh, with, with a heavy heart, but I'm happy to be going one, uh, to do off and do what I'm doing. And you know, thank you for saying all those nice things. Um, this is episode uh, 86, Invisible Walls. This is Marcus Beer for the last time saying we're out. Take care, guys. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And uh, get ready to buy my new games. We're going to talk about the man, and by the man we mean various organizations that hold good folks like us down. Yeah, we're going to talk about the ESA and the ESRB because we never talk about yeah, those yeah. guys. <laughs> we're going to get carpet bombed at some point by one of these places. <laughs> we're not well, be able to you know, let's, show. Let, let's talk about the the ESA to start off with. I mean, you know, E3 this year, what a cluster! F this um, past year, yeah. Yeah, I mean, E3 last year wasn't much. I think the better. problem is it wasn't a cluster. <laughs> I think it was. No, I think it was. I think it wasn't. It, it, there was definitely. There was definitely question. some f cluster. <laughs> to me, a, cl a cluster f is when things are so freaking insane that they just get out of control and you no, can't get no. a handle on it. A cluster f is when there's a lot of f ups all happening at the In same a cluster. time. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the that's the <laughs> yeah, time formation. The ESRB are just trying to justify their existence, and Shane and I have said this before, and I think we're going to say it again. This is where the publishers need to stand up. Right. and basically show that they've got stones they need to say ESRB they're we, paying their salary yeah we pay for you we pay for you and you charge us as far as I'm concerned if it's in the game 
and it's being demoed and Sony are happy for it to go out, the ESRB can go suck a nut. So here's my question, is the ESRB gonna rate this game AO, adults only? Well, they But if they're not gonna do that, then they cannot tell us to censor something hey, when dude, we follow the you. rules. I, I, I'm with you, you follow the rules, you put it behind Mage Gate, case closed. ESRB cannot start get, getting all Gestapo like. <laughs> Modern Warfare 2, otherwise known as Activision <laughs> all over again. I don't think my particular boycott's gonna affect it because it's a drop in the ocean. I admit it's a futile one, it's just for my own personal. Here's it's a, my own personal. Will uh, you buy it used? Uh, no. Cause... You're really not gonna buy or play Modern Warfare and, 2. Uh, no, and I'll tell, I'll tell you why because. But even from the perspective of your job, Marcus, right. it's like you have to play that game. You have to know what happens in that game because it's gonna frame what happens for the next couple years. I have negative feelings, I have animosity towards Activision, I put my hands up. I'm just kind of sick with Activision's attitude of they want to turn the world into a, or the video games industry into a standalone console. Everything has to have, you know, has to be within these little parameters. But I'm just, I'm, you know, I am just kind of sick of Bobby Kotick and Activision. And like I said, my, my boycott is probably pretty, pretty useless. I admit it, but it's just my own my own sense of self-preservation. I have issues with that company and every piece of shit they've pulled this year.